All right, so we're here with Daniel Carlisle, our uh, insurance broker, um, and wanted to share a little bit more behind the scenes of this process. I was, I was telling telling Daniel and told others that in the days right before the storm and really right after the storm, it, it kind of felt like I'd seen this movie before, right? And we talked about the way Bonnie had had led us, but our, our preparations with you began many years before as well. And so I thought that would be a, an interesting story to, to tell and to maybe share some of the of the guidance and wisdom that we integrated all these years for things that other folks could use um, as well. And so I think the the first place to start for me was, you know, the, the very first time we met, I remember having lunch at the at the Cabana Grill and just your philosophy on how insurance integrates with the rest of business planning. That insurance isn't, you know, something you do once a year and you, you know, you buy it and forget about it and it, it's not really an integral part of your business planning. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think probably the number one thing that you know, when we were having that lunch that uh, I kind of gathered out of our conversation and then later on with the board is that buy-in to risk management at the top, the tone at the top, because you got to have that component in order for all this other stuff to flow down through the, the process. Um, and really in business continuity planning, uh, is a, you can break it down into seven to ten different steps depending on what methodology you're using. Um, but the purchasing of insurance really falls into two buckets, I, I put it. One's the risk assessment phase and one is the business impact phase. And walking through those scenarios <clears throat> of saying, what are our high probability losses? And what does our property look like? And what does, do our operations look like after that? And so insurance being a risk transfer mechanism, I think is really important to bring that into the whole picture. What, what is the, the funding mechanism that's gonna help us post event? Let's, let's dig in on each of those though, because I think those were two really great questions. So the first one is, what are the, you had a word in there, what are the most probable perils? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, you could kind of dream up every possible scenario, but really if somebody's just getting started in this, just let's look at the, ob you know, let's right, go yeah. just start with start so, with kind of what's obvious. So I, I think the benefit of y'all's approach that y'all took at Port Royal is, it's not that you're gonna plan for every disaster that could possibly happen, because there's limited time and resources, and we never know what exactly is gonna happen. There's always going to be kind of a, a black swan sure. uh, that you just never knew would come. But by doing the planning for either a hurricane, a fire, a shooting, a cyber event, whatever it may be, you you know what has to go right. You can't always tell what's going to go wrong, but you know what has to go right to continue operations. And I think that exercise of, of right kind of and and those just to to be real candid, those are kind of the the four and the water perils for us obviously right. but just if folks want to know okay where do we even begin to think about this you know what are the obvious natural disasters what are the the obvious um, property type you know fire being a, a risk for everybody um, what are the, the people related dangers so we have a lot of water so there's that and then now um, the active shooter conversation has to be, I think, be in, in everybody's conversation, and then the the technological ones, right? And so we've, you, you think, as you said, you sort of think about what are the most um, critical processes and, and what can bring those down, right? right? Right. Okay. So then, and and we, you know, I think when we first got started, the cyber was even a new one that 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 we that we added to the list, and sort of in the in last week we shared a video with with Bonnie, but our process was. You know, about once a year, as we got ready to renew, I'd say 90 days, 120 days before renewal, we'd sit down and what if our, um, each of those scenarios, and, and like you said, figure out what are the gaps, what funding in the event any of these happen, where, where do we have gaps or where do we have extra expenses or where do we have, where do we have needs or where do we even need support? You know, some of our policies even have some, some really interesting kind of supportive mechanisms right. in the right. in the event they they occur but that first step of um, what, are, what are we what are the most obvious things we're right. at, at, right. at risk of is where I think a lot of us you know we don't it's uncomfortable right I guess you do this for a living so you're probably a little more comfortable talking to, talking about um, about perils and and what could go wrong but I think when we run businesses it's not our favorite day um, 
to to roadmap out you know all the different things that can go wrong but um, I think there's we've seen there's tremendous value in just when that does happen there's a, a piece of knowing that that you prepared for it again like you said you not every detail but that that you got the big stuff right and if you get the if you get the, the big foundation right you have time to spend as you're going through this on each of those smaller right. um, each of those smaller decisions and, and I think as we went through that process one of the probably largest components to keep the, the key to operations continuing in the event of a hurricane were employees and how those were, be pack, uh, were impacted and you know with the board and you and that was a deliberate attempt to say we want to keep our staff we want to keep them going and um, in business in interruption that coverage uh, a lot of carriers will carve out payroll uh, because they treat that as a variable expense uh, but you can make a conscious effort to put that back in and of course pay premiums for it right but it, it's a calculated move it you know it's got to be in the budget but it's got to fit into your overall plan um, and so you know, I think our conversations led to, okay, let's imagine an event like Harvey. Right, exactly. And what do we do with our employees, you know? And, and I think the, just the team mentality, the family mentality that you and the board had was, well, absolutely, we have to keep them on, so we have to find the mechanisms to keep that moving forward. Um, now, personally, something that I didn't foresee and what, how you guys have engaged all staff post-event, which I think is amazing, uh, and I uh, have to give you guys props for that. that that's that's well, the goodwill that's created around the community and I'm sure your employees as well has been pretty amazing. That's, I think that, that's been one of the silver linings and you're right, we did what if, we knew we wanted to keep our team and, and we, we absolutely foresaw a hurricane at some point. I mean, that was certainly on the list of things to do. I don't think I ever foresaw being shut down as long as we were shut down and, and then didn't make the leap of, okay, you've kept your team and you're shut down this long. What are you going to do? And that's where, by having the other things somewhat already on track, we were able to to, to really put some effort behind. Okay, we're going to have a, a great training program, or we're going to have a great community service program because those are both. Um, if you've got time and you've got team members, those are things that companies would love to do more of. You know, all, all the time. There wasn't a year that went by where we thought, oh man, we've got plenty of time for training. You know, so um, to have now an abundance of time. We were able to make those strategic decisions, but if we hadn't had the plan to begin with, and had the insurance in place to begin with, those would have never even been um, options. Right. So okay, so let's let's dig in there because I think that's where we've had the most questions from um, just folks saying, okay, how how do you how did you go about doing this? And it started with really talking about business interruption in a very nuts and bolts. I mean, we literally prepared a. A roadmap, if you will, that right. we gave the insurance company that said, in the event of a of a hurricane or, or a fire, um, this is literally how we plan to navigate it from a financial right. perspective. So basically, in the risk assessment, obviously the hurricane was was part of that conversation, and then the next part was the impact. What, what is the business impact, and what are the costs? How do you quantify how much you need to purchase, how much business interruption, and measuring that um, in a in a similar way to what the claim would be paid and evaluated. And so you guided us through that process. The, the way our policies looked before our interactions with you and the way our policies looked after our interactions with you are, I mean, just like a glove, right? I mean, we really tailored that policy um, theoretically so that it, it fits like a glove through this process. So if, if another, um, so, so obviously, if you're in Corpus Christi, call Daniel. But if you're not in Corpus Christi, and you, you want, can still call okay, <laughs> and, you, and you want to, um, and you want to find somebody to guide you through this process, because uh, it's, a, I mean, your background in particular, you did this for a number of, for a number of years. You yes. developed these, these models. Right. So, yeah, I worked for an organization before Carlisle Insurance that our focus were was a component of business continuity planning, where we worked with a lot of uh, the major international companies to help audit and or quantify components through business continuity planning. So uh, when I got the opportunity to visit with you guys, a lot of that experience came into play at um, a holistic way of looking at insurance versus just saying, hey, check the box, we got insurance, but let's be more strategic of why we're purchasing it and what what risk are we addressing. But forcing us to answer the question of how's this gonna impact you financially? If you have a hurricane, how's it gonna impact you financially? What are you gonna wanna, you know, 
okay, you're going to keep people. What does that literally mean? You know, walking us through that. So, so is there um, is there a, an industry certification? Is there how does somebody know if the person that they're dealing with is is truly an expert in this area? Right. So uh, th there is a whole field of experts that are, you know, business continuity planners that don't necessarily sell insurance. I'm kind of a little bit of a hybrid, but there's a organization called Disaster Recovery uh, Institute International. Um, it's an international organization that does award certifications for co business continuity planning, different components, different experience levels of it. Uh, so if you are looking for somebody to assist that, it may not be your insurance broker necessarily. Okay. It could okay. be a third party is continuity planner to, to help you guide you along that process, or it may be some combination of the two. Um, but that's something I would look for, or just okay. simply ask them what, what is your experience with business continuity planning and how in insurance interacts with all that. Okay, so. wow, I didn't even know, yeah. know that piece. So we, we lucked out having having you being able to wear wear both hats because it was, it was certainly helpful. Um, so for us, the payroll question was an obvious one. You know, we're literally, on an island, right? And, and our teams um, have very specialized skill sets. And, and we knew that if there were ever a time that, you know, we just couldn't lose our teams because getting back open would be darn near impossible. So, so that was um, fundamentally, it was a, a selfish decision to, to keep our teams. Now, I, I think we've approached it um, in a way that's beneficial to our teams and beneficial to the community and beneficial to our, um, to our owners. But I think if we all think about our businesses and and those you well, know the stakeholders, yeah right? I yeah mean, it's, I mean it's we've moved our our society has moved um, for the better I think to looking at businesses uh, and the stakeholders involved versus just a profit and loss uh, P&L right but and, even if you want to take a, a P&L perspective if you want to look beyond six months or a year if you're looking at a longer time horizon I mean having a, a having a dedicated workforce is I think, fundamental to, to, to any business. Uh, what are some of the other nuances, um, sticking kind of in the realm of business interruption, what are some of the other things that people need to, to think about in thinking about that policy and in thinking about planning? I know for us, like time periods right. are, are uh, one of them. What are some of the other things? Yes, some of, so, you know, business interruption in general is a coverage on the traditional sense is triggered by property physical damage. Um, so it's not a be in and end all to this continuity planning because there's certain things that we can't insure for. But when you are looking at it, there are several uh, enhancements and endorsements that you can put on to, to help address it. That, like I believe, for example, we were talking about what could really impact Port Royal if maybe it wasn't a direct hit or maybe it wasn't a hurricane. Uh, so we looked at maybe a radius. What happens if the bridge gets taken down on the right. way to the, to the island? Right. So you know we 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 built in some contingent and some ingress egress uh, business interruption to because you know there, I think there was a event in South Padre Island where a um, a tugboat or something like that actually took down a bridge. Now that could impact you it may not be for a year or two years, but it could be for a week or two weeks, and depending on the timing of that. Um, that could be a material impact to y'all's operations. So for a lot of tourist folks, I think this is a very relevant conversation in that you're not just um, potentially harmed by a direct event, but even some, some indirect events, particularly if you've got access access issues. Yeah, so like there's access said, issues, right? there's uh, dependent property issues. So if there's, say, something in Port A, or Port A is down, are people going to show up at your hotel? And that would be a contingent business interruption issue. Once again, that could be added by endorsement, could be sublimited, could be covered at the same cost. So if they're a business that's that's dependent on, um, let's say you're right next door to SeaWorld and, and, you're, and you're a hotel right next to SeaWorld and your business is built on SeaWorld being open and for right. some reason SeaWorld's not open, then you're... So the, the traditional business interruption would only cover your loss if you incurred property damage, which uh, resulted in loss of business. But if SeaWorld incurred property damage, you don't own that property, that would be called a contingent business interruption loss and does not come standard um, when you just buy so that coverage. So it's one of those things you want to ask about. Another thing that we talked about, um, and you've already kind of led into, is the seasonality of your business. Because um, there are certain things that will either have a monthly period of limited indemnity, uh, where it could limit how much you can collect per month, and or co-insurance issues where you don't insure for a full 12 months and uh, you're penalized on, on all of your claims because you're underinsured. So all of those uh, 
potential pitfalls are out there that I think when you are looking at the business, the, the business interruption, the business continuity planning of it, I think you need to have those discussions with your broker on, you know, does this really fit what our business looks like? It's not a one size fits all type right. approach. Right. Of course, within there is also budgets, and you know, there's going to be conversations, trade offs on on what you, what what the organization can afford and what they can't. But realistically speaking, this isn't a. Without sharing specific numbers, this is not an obscenely expensive type of policy to get. No, it, it's, mean, it's, it's very it's very it, similar it, to the rate you would, you would pay on your. On your property insurance. So if your building's insured for a million dollars um, and you say you bought a million dollars of business interruption, it would be a very similar rate that you're looking at. Yeah, so it wasn't cost, cost. I mean, certainly it was expensive and, and our, our board and ownership, you know, uh, agreed to agreed to do this. And really, we took an even more um, structured approach. I mean, we even went so far, uh, and, and there were board members leading this effort as well, but to really be sure that our, our declarations um, spoke were updated to reflect you know the realities we were we were built in 1985 so 30 years ago insurance was handled a little differently than it is now in 2014 2015 um, we made some some updates to our declarations to just clarify um, who's buying who's responsible for what in the insurance process and and then we we even went so far um, as to add a, an addendum to our bylaws to say in the event of a business interruption claim, here's, again, we had the roadmap for the insurance company, now here's the roadmap for the owners and then of for here's, the how, claim. So here's it, how we're going to follow that. It, I feel like you guys took it a step farther than just business continuity planning for your operations, but we also looked ahead at what is the claim going to look like when it comes in. you got to keep in mind that Port Royal at the highest levels, a nonprofit owned right. by individual unit owners, which has varying interests. And um, the traditional business interruption policy is not designed necessarily to address individual interests versus an, an organization such as Port Royal. So it was very important for us to get out ahead of that. If and when that, that claim occurs, that there is no um, eliminate as much vagueness on, on where the money should go and, and whose money it is. And so I, I think uh, the board and, and all of us were, were very active in, in getting ahead of that curve because it's much difficult. It's much more difficult to have that conversation after the claim. And, and, the, and I think it isn't to say that we haven't had our share of challenges yes. and, and there's questions. Been lots of and, things that we've learned. And not that everything is, we're not sitting here today with everything resolved by, by any stretch. But, um, but I think uh, we're, if I, if I dare say, uh, we're. We, <laughs> We can kind of see uh, the, the beginning stages of the line, so it does feel like the preparation um, was worthwhile, um, and and that is is going to ultimately result in a better outcome for our owners, for our team members, for the community, for all the different stakeholders. Um, not that we're all the way through the, the through the journey, but that it does, um, and, and I have on the informal perspective, perhaps you have a, a little more, but the, there are benefits to the planning process even if it's not perfect afterwards. So planning doesn't guarantee that every conversation you have with an insurance company after the fact, you're going to love that conversation right. or that checks are just gonna drop in the mail like hot potatoes. You know, planning doesn't guarantee any of those things, but it does give it gives you a roadmap to follow. It does make sure that that alignment um, is is present. I mean, we we knew. I mean, we literally spoke the the day after the storm and began to put things in motion right away. We, there wasn't a well, we've got to check, we've got to make decisions. No, we knew those first few decisions based on planning how to how to get moving, how to mobilize resources. Um, and I, I think the planning definitely gave us that confidence to make to make some of those early early decisions so having insurance and having planning have, having planned ahead and, and having advice from from you doesn't make it all you know unicorns and roses um, but it, it does make it a manageable right. process. Well, hopefully it, it puts us in the best position to execute the, those, that plan I mean but like you said there's always going to be bumps in the road um, 
what we try to do is, is by planning and policy design, mitigate as much of that as possible, such as combining the flood and the windstorm business interruption together. So there's no discrepancy between carriers fighting, um, things like that, that, that we, we tried to get ahead, we tried to get ahead of to eliminate as many of those arguments as possible. But, you know, at the end of the day, these insurance companies are writing pretty big checks and you better believe they're going to do their due diligence to uh, make sure that they have the proper documentation to document that loss. So, so, so we're, we're running long, but I don't want to end this conversation in case there are business owners. That, I, I know this was a tremendous education for me over the last several years with Daniel. Um, and, and I want to do a, a speed round if he'll let me and just ask a few other questions. So if you're, if you're, uh, if, if you just wanted to talk hurricanes, we're kind of to the end of, of that chapter. But if, if you're um, interested in other types of insurances that, that could be relevant, I want to dig in on some of those. So um, let's talk about the, the cyber side of things because that was something that I think um, you introduced us to. The, the, it was kind of like a two by four. Oh yeah, we really should um, have, have thought about this. So let's talk about some of the different uh, protections that are available in the family of cyber products. Yeah, so uh, the, the world of cyber insurance is, has been I think at the forefront of the media for, for several years now. Um, you know, you had the Home Depot event, Target event, uh, that, that's all in the cyber world. But we're, where we've really seen in both claims activity and um, insurance focus is more of small to medium business uh, because those tend to be more susceptible targets than the larger corporations. Uh, so within a cyber liability policy, there's, I would say, about seven different types of coverage. So it, it's really it's a, really a package of different mm -hmm. coverages because there's the liability aspect of it if the lawsuit comes because, because of a cyber event, which could be as simple as somebody posting something on your Facebook that, that uh, maybe wasn't monitored and was uh, offensive to somebody and, and they filed suit. Um, basically anything that is electronic, more than likely is not going to be covered under general liability. Okay, so that, yeah, liability. so I think that fundamental statement there uh, for, for business owners that haven't had this conversation could be like, oh, wow, you mean it's carved out completely. So, because right. most of our transactions now are, are digital. I mean, I would say probably less than 10%, maybe even less than that of our transactions are something other than um, digital. Right. Um, and then our communications and our communications with our, our guests, you know, social media websites, again, much more shifted to, right. you know, we're not mailing postcards that often anymore. We're Right. We're, we're doing it that way and so the, the cyber side of things really catches up sort of your old school traditional mm -hmm. general yeah, yeah. liability and type There policies. might be some policies that have a little bit here and a little bit there um, but in order to truly get the breadth of coverage that I feel that organizations need today it, it, I always recommend a separate standard uh, cyber liability policy. Really cyber liability probably is the right now. Cyber and data recovery because it, it also goes into cyber attacks, ransomware, um, things of that nature, uh, social engineering, where maybe somebody's email's been hacked, say, hey, please send a check to this fictitious vendor. Uh, we've seen a lot of those claims re recently. Um, that that can be pick, yeah. picked up on a cyber liability policy. Business interruption is also a component of cyber liability. So, you know, once again, we talked about identifying key processes. Well, IT is absolutely an important process to almost every organization today. And a major event, um, you know, could really impact you got your fundamental your ability fundamental to all the, yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, that, that's a component of it. Like I said, there's, there's a whole, I mean, we spent 30, 45 yeah. minutes talking about what cyber can and cannot but cover. The, but the fact they call it cyber liability is really misleading because there's interruption coverage, there's data recovery. There's notifying individuals, there's identity theft protection. Uh, you know, you always think of third parties, it could be your employee's information that right. actually gets lost right. from this place. Right. And you have a duty to notify uh, anybody that potentially had their, their private information compromised, their personal information so, compromised. So in, in buying this policy, we had to, to really <clears throat> work hard to demonstrate to them that we met certain competencies. Yeah, competencies. So it really, it was a, 
you know, the first time um, we, we really stepped into this fully, and I think it's been three years at this point, it really forced us to up our game in terms of auditing. You've always had a financial audit, but uh, sort of an right. IT type type audit, data security, you know, anybody that handles credit cards, you really want to think about those processes and, um, you know, something interesting folks may or may, may not find interesting, but um, if you call into our reservation center, you know, you're providing your credit card number to um, to uh, uh, an, an agent um, and, and we want to protect that and, and our phone, phone uh, lines are recorded uh, for training purposes and for all sorts of reasons. They're not kept forever, but they are kept for a, a period of time. And one of the things we had we do is that segment is beeped out. So in the recording, that that phone number or that credit card number is not a part of the recording. So if you were to hack in and get into our system and access the recordings, you're not going to get exactly. credit card numbers. Things like that um, that may not be immediately obvious, um, but it was a wonderful checklist for us. They're just good business practices period um, that that again stepping into the realm of these policies yes the, the protection is um, ha, has proven to be very useful but also just the the, the checklist right. well, was, was important I, I think it's important to recognize that insurance is not a replacement for controls that you have in place on your IT your financial all your operations and processes um, it's really the, the backfall it, it's the backup it's in the event that your controls didn't operate their spoke the way they're supposed to, the insurance is there to, to help take over because, like I said, if we can think of it and we can prevent it, then your money's probably better spent Prevent. developing controls and preventing it. And that's once again part of the business continuity planning process is when you assess those risks, now you decide, do you buy insurance for it? Do you implement controls? Do you implement redundancies? Uh, it's all about building that resilience, if you will, and, and being intentional of of why you make those decisions. Absolutely. So I think for us, the the it started with buying insurance, right? But it evolved into a much bigger conversation and a, a much deeper strategic partnership. There's no way we as a management team or even as an ownership group or a board would really be able to think of all of the different things that you need to plan for. So in the context of buying insurance, we were really able to turn that into almost a SWOT analysis, right? A strategic planning exercise. Um, and, and thankfully you were willing to, to, to spend the time planning with us, uh, you know, planning with me beforehand. And then we would present to the, to the management team and get their feedback. And then we would present to the board and get their feedback. In some cases we would present to, to ownership. We were making some um, some some bigger shifts, but those refinement after refinement after refinement, and you, you end up with a uh, what we feel like, you know, was a a, a really pretty protected um, scenario, and ultimately we'll see how it how it plays out. But um, I, I'd say we're we're doing fine, and we just thought it would be helpful to to share this conversation for other um, business owners. I think you can even take the same approach to your family. Really, I mean, we haven't we haven't touched on it, but I think the concept of you know, what are all the bad things that can happen? Let's have a plan for that. And if we have gaps, let's consider um, getting insurance for that. You know, that, that fundamental thought process can apply to, to kind of any type of, of entity. And it's, it's not as scary um, as, as it seems on the surface, right? I mean, the more we get rehearsed at planning for these things, the less intimidating um, right. and they are. But and along that same line, but I think Oral is very good about doing is always you always have to go back and revisit this plan. It's not a once one time done. We don't have to visit for five years. I mean, risk evolve, organizations evolve, insurance evolves. Um, so it's important that you keep that alive. Um, and, uh, and I think you guys are a great demonstration of that. Also back to the, plan, the family planning, you know remodeling I mean kids are growing up different ages different things you have to think of I mean you, it, it, it's a way of operating a way of living and, and you know once again it's like going back to the organization I, I think the team that you guys have built with Bonnie's expertise and planning is just it's it's a team effort it's not something that one person can right, do right. it's not something that one expert can do um, it's getting management team involved and getting everybody together and say what what worries you the most what keeps you up at night 
So just to, to wrap up, and again, been a long, a long video, but hopefully one that's useful if this is a topic that you're um, that you're interested in. And, and both Daniel and I are available for questions. You can just kind of comment below or shoot us an email, um, and we'll be happy to, to point you in the right direction. But thank you for um, your guidance all these years and your guidance um, you know, during the during the storm. And I don't think there's been a week that's gone by that we haven't, or a day in some cases that we haven't been in in touch. Um, throughout this and just really encouraging us to, to think about it in this way has been helpful. So really that's what I want to share with folks is just just think about it this way. Right, right. And I want to thank Fort Royal also for involving Carlisle in both insurance and everything beyond um, inviting me to this interview. I appreciate it. And a good partnership. Thank you. Thanks for watching the latest episode of Port Royal Strong. I wanted to say thanks to the community and to the hundreds of thousands of people that watch these videos each and every week. We really appreciate all the comment, love, and support that you give to our teams as we go through this journey. To see all of our other episodes and our trailer, check out portroyalstrong.com.